today. Um, my name is Ruth Indrick. I'm the project coordinator at the Kennebec Estuary Land Trust. And I'm here with John Pence, who is the um, shellfish warden at in the town of Georgetown. Um, John, can you talk a little bit about your past working as the warden in town? Yep. Yeah, my name is John Hence. We're here on a nice sunny day at Little River Reed State Park. And I was born in Georgetown many years ago. I spent 20 years in the Navy and then I retired from Bath Iron Works and I've had this job for now 30 years as a municipal shellfish conservation warden for Georgetown. I've worked in multiple other towns and I find the job to be very rewarding because 99.9% .9 of the time we are training and educating the public to the harvesting of soft shell clams. And we use several methods to do that. In most cases, digging in Georgetown, we're using a clam hoe in nice soft sand. We do have some mud, and in many of the other municipalities, we have heavy mud, where digging is a different situation altogether. The most important thing is safety. But first of secondly, you want the right style clam hoe. And this is a modified pitchfork. They run about $70, and then they got to need to be modified for the clam flats. And this is digging to save your back. And several other clam hoes you may find on the market are a long tined hoe. This is good in certain substrates. And this style, with a little bit longer tine, was used 50, 60 years ago by almost everyone that dug clams in the sand. However, that is history. And when you put the hoe back, you always want to set it with the tines down into the sand for safety's sake. The first thing we want to do is find the siphon holes of reasonably good-sized clams. So the bigger the siphon hole, the chances are very good the clam is going to be bigger. And we want to take clams primarily that are two inches, soft shell clams that are primarily at least two inches or longer in length. So the first thing is we found some good holes in a nice nestled area. These are the holes I'm after. We want to dig a good size hole here and then proceed. So about a 45 degree angle to get rid of the unnecessary sand and substrate in front of these good holes. So we're digging ourselves a decent sized hole to work from. Now we'll proceed. There's two clams here. And that is probably a short clam, under two inches. That one's short, and that one's short. Now we'll proceed on to some slightly bigger holes where we may find a two and a quarter, to two and a half inch clam. Now that's a good two and a quarter inch. That's a good one. These are too small. And it's nice to see a lot of small clams because that means next year these clams are going to be mature and good digging. Now here we should find a pretty good sized clam. And he's not as big as I hope. <clears throat> Something of interest, you can see this white area, that's the growth this summer. And this clam is probably one, two, three years old. That's a very good growth rate. Now with a quick measure, I'll show you the two inch rule. 10% of your clams can be under two inches. Now this clam is a good two and a quarter, and the way you measure it, set the bottom of the clam, its foot end down, and that's two and an eighth of an inch. That's a perfect 
steamer clam. And to show you one that's too small, but again, you can have 10% under 2 inches. Now that guy is good. Now here's one that's definitely short. Darn it. Two and a sixteenth. But again, this is a good test on my eye. That one's good. By a sixteenth of an inch. Okay, here we go. This clam could be one of your 10%. So 10% you may keep. These two I know are too short. Oh, here's a good one. And that's good by a quarter of an inch. So this is a soft shell clam. Um, it's also can be called a steamer clam. Um, there are other types of clams in Maine. Um, one thing that you'll notice about the soft shell clam shell is that the shells don't ever fit smugly closed. Um, and so as John was explaining earlier, these clams can be found pretty deep down in the sediment. Um, and they that's part of their protection. the rings on the outside of the shell and so there are some deep grooves so clams grow very well during the summer when it's warmer out um, there's lots of food around and then they slow down their metabolism um, there's less food available in the winter and so you get these deeper grooves so you can roughly count the age of the clam so this one is going to be one two three four five six maybe seven years old um, so this is its seventh year um, so in order to, so I'm going to go through a clam dissection and talk through the different parts of the clam. Um, so to start a dissection, the first thing that I do is I cut through the adductor muscles of the clam. Um, so I'm just going to use a butter knife for that. Slide the knife in along the top edge of the clam um, to cut those muscles. And the muscles are what are keeping the shell closed. So once you cut those muscles, you can open up the clam. Um, so I'll just set the knife down. Um, all right, so here's the inside of your clam. One of the first things you can see is this piece around the edge here. So this runs around the whole edge of the clam. This is called the mantle. The mantle is what the clam uses to make its shell. So it builds its own shell. It takes in nutrients from the water surrounding it, and it uses those to construct its shell and build its shell out. Um, this top part here um, can, is often called the neck of the clam. This is the siphon. Um, so if you look at the top part of the siphon right here, there are two little holes in it with some little cilia right on top. And so one end of this clam, the water pulls the water, or the clam pulls the water in. It cycles through the body of the clam, and then it spits it excess water and waste out the other side. Um, and if you look on the inside, you can kind of see where those two holes come in. So it comes in on this side, and then the water goes through and comes out the opposite side. Another thing to look at at your clam is this piece right here. So this is a thin layer. You can kind of see grooves in this layer. These are the gills. So just like gills on a fish, this is what the clam uses um, to take air out of the water. They also use their gills to filter other food things into this sac here, which is where their stomach is located. Their other organs are here as well. Um, they're also little. It's hard to see, but mostly in here. So this is a lot of stomach. Um, right attached to the bottom part of the stomach, this is the foot of the clam. Now, some clams have very big feet, and they use the foot to move around a lot. Um, this foot, compared to the size of the clam, you can see it's really little. Um, so it, they use their foot when they are young um, and very small, but once a clam gets bigger, its foot stops growing for the soft-shell clams. They mostly just move up and down, but they're not moving side to side much. So this foot is not used too much for the adult clam. Um, so this part, the stomach right here, so what I'm going to do right now is find an interesting piece that's inside the stomach. So I need to break into the stomach a little bit. Um, it's a little gooey. And what I'm trying to find is this thing right here. So this is called the crystalline style. Um, so this is, it looks like a little worm, but it's, it's a part of the digestive system of the clam. So we have enzymes in our stomachs that we use to break down our food. What the clam has is this crystalline style, and so what it does, it grinds against a little plate, so it kind of grinds against a plate in the stomach, and as it does that, 
enzymes are released out of this crystalline style and that's what breaks down the food here inside the stomach of the clam. And I think those are all of the neat parts that I wanted to show you um, for today. This is a sandworm which is good for bait for the winter flounder and many of the other fish in our main waters. The difference between a sandworm and a bloodworm is where you harvest them. The sandworm will tend to come out of the sand. They're usually 8 to 10 to 12 inches deep, where a bloodworm is found in the mud, and it's a pinkish color, and it's very good for bait for all kinds of fish, and it will be shipped all over the world, where the sandworm can only be shipped in the <clears throat> New England states because it's rather delicate and they're refrigerated and shipped in a moss type of seaweed that's found in the marsh grasses and harvested by our different diggers. So this sandworm is not really looking to bite me. You never want to do this with a bloodworm because it's going to wind up between your fingers and when they bite you really know it. It stings. I hope it doesn't bite me. <laughs> What sort of safety things do people need to think about while they're out here? If you find a piece of broken glass anywhere on the clam flats, please take it home and throw it in the garbage. We've been doing that now with kelp here, what, seven years, yep. eight years? And we found a few pieces of glass, but one piece of glass can cut a child's foot terribly. And once in a while we find an old spike. So we take all of that home and it goes in the trash. And safety-wise, using the proper clam hoe, one such as this, and we'll be providing you with the names and addresses where you can purchase one of these. But never run with a clam hoe. I don't care if you're an adult, a child, and it's sometimes hard to keep the children from running on clam day. But we all work at that as a team. I know sometimes, um, especially here where it's so nice and sandy, I'll be I'll start digging with a clam hoe and then I'll switch to digging with my hands. Is there anything I need to worry about with my fingers to make sure that I keep myself safe? And yes, as most people when they're out here on clam day digging, they're going to tend to use their fingers and we try to have them use the clam hoe to dig the clam out. But Again, what most people will do is they'll dig down, and this is this new growth, this white, is almost as sharp as a sharp, freshly sharpened knife. And if you swing your fingers the wrong way, you will get a cut. And it's like a paper cut. It stings because of the salt. But be careful there when you're digging the clam up. This is perfectly all right. Once you've found the clam, you get down there and you can pull them right out. But it's that initial contact. Be careful. So I saw that you had um, a metal ring that was about two inches, or that was two inches round, and then you were also using a plastic ring. What's the difference between the two? And what could people do if they want to have a ring and make sure that they're measuring correctly when they're digging themselves? Okay. This is a state certified ring with a serial number on it, and. Weights and Measures has measured this particular ring, and if I have to write a summons for people harvesting too many short soft-shell clams, I would have to reference the serial number on this ring that's proven it's been tested to exactly two inches. And just to show you how you can make your own clam ring, a piece of two-inch Schedule 40 PVC pipe cut will match so close you cannot tell the difference. Now the pipe is going to have a little oblong to it, maybe a thousandth of an inch. So if you're using a measure like this and you want to be careful, simply don't take any clams that fit through this ring. But the two match almost identical. I cannot see a difference. Right, so um, 
one thing that John had talked about was figuring out um, if the clam flats are opened or closed. And so I want to talk a little bit about how that process happens so that um, you can understand a little bit more about um, how the clams that you get at the market or that you're digging, how you know that they're safe. So the Maine Department of Marine Resources has a very extensive testing program to test for two different types of pollution. One is fecal coliform bacteria. And so this is looking for contamination that may come from humans or other warm-blooded animals, um, viruses, bacteria, that could make people sick. And so the sampling is actually for an indicator bacteria. It indicates if there's a source of fecal pollution from any sort of warm-blooded animal. So the DMR does that, that testing and then they make maps like this to show if the flats are opened or closed. Um, here's just showing the local area. So here's the Kennebec here. You can see all of these red dots. These are sample sites. So there are more than a thousand sample sites along the coast that are tested um, for this bacteria sampling. I'm going to do a quick demonstration of how the sampling works. Um, and so I brought along some supplies. So an important thing to have for sampling is a cooler. Um, the cooler keeps the sample at the right temperature. If it gets too warm, um, then the bacteria that are in the sample can start growing and so you won't get an accurate count. Um, so it's important to store your samples in a cooler. The actual sampling is done in a way that helps to prevent um, your any sort of that contamination from your fingers from getting into this sample. So they use a sample bag like this um, and so that your fingers aren't anywhere near it, the opening, and then to open up the sample bag you just rip the top off like that, make sure you don't touch it. Um, to do the sampling I'm going to walk out into the creek. If I were doing the sampling as an actual DMR staff member I'd have on a pair of hip boots so that my skin isn't in contact with the water, but since it's just a demonstration, I'll be out in my sandals today. Um, and I'd also make sure that I was going to water that was at least knee deep. Um, we're just doing this example in the creek out here, and so it's low tide, so the water's not quite that deep. Um, but actual sampling is done in at least knee deep water. not to contaminate the sample, what you do is dip the bag underwater, at least a um, foot and a half underwater, again this is just an example for today, and fill that up with your sample. Um, then you'd want to drain just enough water so that it's between these two lines. Um, if there's too much water, when they're doing the analysis in the lab, um, they need to shake this sample bag, so you want to make sure there isn't too much water in there close the bag, um, it's kind of cool, you just swing it shut and it seals itself like that. Um, so this is what a collected sample looks like. Um, it will go, so if the sample were being collected for the DMR, they'd take it back to their lab and then they would um, first shake it a number of times, um, then they would pour it through a filter, onto a filter paper, and so the water would go through and everything that's in the sample um, would get stuck onto that filter plate paper. The filter paper then gets put onto a plate that has some sort of food that makes um, the, the bacteria grow, and so that plate with the sample, and with the filter, and then gets put into an incubator for about 24 hours. Um, it's then taken out and there, if there is bacteria growing in the sample, there will be little dots on the surface of that filter paper. And so to determine the contamination level, you just count the number of dots and average that up to figure out how many, um, how much bacterial pollution is in the sample. Um, the DMR also does sampling for red tide. And so red tide is caused by phytoplankton. Um, that are just floating around in the water, um, but a certain type of phytoplankton called alexandrium, when it blooms, it can produce this toxin called saxitoxin. Um, and so it only blooms at a certain time of year, um, and so to measure for that, um, 
phytoplankton. DMR does two types of sampling. They'll do, they'll collect water samples and they'll look at them under the microscope to see if they can see um, Alexandrium, that's the name of the plankton, floating around. And if they find Alexandrium, then they'll start um, sampling the clams. And so they dig a number of clams, mussels, um, and they will take those back to the lab, grind them up, and then determine how toxic the samples are. Um, so if they determine that there's a, too much bacterial pollution or too much red tide, they immediately close down the clam flats in order to keep people safe. Um, and so this sampling, the bacterial pollution sampling happens six times a year. Um, the red tide sampling happens regularly during the season when plankton are, when those toxic plankton are in the water. Um, so if you're digging a clam from an area where the flats open, the water is clean and the clam is good to eat. This is a very interesting feature to show you how this creek can shift its direction driven by ocean currents and tidal flow and many other things. But to show you where the creek has shifted over and worn away the sand behind me and showing some of the clams that may have been deceased hundreds of years ago and still be found vertically as this one is. And that shell could be a hundred years old or a thousand years old. We've run some tests in uncertified labs and found that this is, the shell doesn't break down that fast. And as the water washed away these vertical shells and they tip over, and that's what you see is the majority laying flat. So these are European green crabs. They are an invasive species um, that has been causing some problems for the clams. Um, they have been in Maine for more than 100 years, but with warm weather, their population can get really high, and they're very good at eating young um, clams that are growing. Um, so to identify them, the best way is to look at the top of their shell, and they have five spines on either side of their eyes. These both here are pretty green, but sometimes green crabs are not that green, so their color maybe isn't the best way to ID them. But if you can count five spines on either side of their eyes, um, and then kind of this uh, pentagon sort of shape, um, that's one way to ID them. And then these, both of these crabs are males. You can tell by looking at this piece on the underside of their carapace. For the, <laughs> for the females, um, it's rounded. For the males, it comes to a point like this and is narrower. Um, so these crabs um, don't get too much bigger than this and their population has just gotten to a level where it's caused problems for clam or for for clams and with climate change and warmer water temperatures there are concerns that they will continue to be more of a problem and increase um, their impact on clams over time so some towns are trapping these um, there's a group at Manomet that is trying and they're working with other partners and they're trying to figure out how to create a market um, in order to figure out effective ways to decrease the population of these crabs.